Global shipping, we've been talking about it. Those costs are now spiking as a rebound in consumer demand coincides with severe bottlenecks in freight transport. Now, some of the world's largest ports in southern China are at reduced capacity amid fresh COVID-19 outbreaks, while ports on the U.S. West Coast are chock full of container ships just waiting to offload a rising tide of imports. Joining us now, Patrick Berglund. He's the CEO of Zeneda, which tracks global cargo flows and prices. You know, we're not used to hearing uh, about shipping really until it becomes a problem. You make the point that the root cause of these challenges really started back years ago. But of course, the pandemic has made what were maybe choppy waters, like a category four storm and worse. Which problems are temporary, but which are here to stay for some time? Hey, great question. Uh, thank you for inviting me first and foremost to CNN, Paul. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak to you about this topic. I think, I think it's, it's structural challenges that, that becomes very obvious now. And it's, it's an industry that has been, you know, for decades, decades struggling on, on, with weak market conditions on the seller side. And, and, and in this case, that would be the shipping lines, right? And through that, they haven't had the ability to invest into the infrastructure that is required to let, you know, uh, these supply chains better absorb these types of shocks. And the situation we're now seeing in, in Yantian is, 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 you know, an accumulated amount of, of events that have, has happened over the last, I would say, 18 months. Think about it, from China shutting down to Europe shutting down. Partially U.S., you had Brexit, congestions in L.A. and Sydney, port strikes at the East Coast, Ever Given and then Yantian. These are just some of the events, right? And the infrastructure is sort of strained to the maximum, where supply is in, in, in the wrong places of the world and, and empty boxes are hard, hard to get a hold of. And, and the carriers have been struggling for, for decades with this, and then COVID comes like the perfect storm on this. Right. So at this point, we're, you know, we're seeing a market that that already now looks to have uh, putting Christmas season at risk. And, and if this continues over a longer period of time, there will be either new entrants uh, appearing or there will be political interest to step in, in, in into this industry to, you know, help Asia uh, as as the mecca or, or global hub of production remain there. I mean, the this consequences of this situation is, is potentially nearshoring as well, right? Yeah, it's so interesting that, that you say, uh, in fact, that Christmas here, that the supply chain through, to, uh, chain through to Christmas is at risk. You know, the increase in costs have been incredibly disruptive. I mean, some of the stuff that was in the research was eye-popping, 800% increase in the shipping costs in some cases. So where are the solutions that will actually have an impact on that cost structure and the supply chains? I mean, I notice here in the United States, there is a lot of pressure on the U.S. for them to do something on their ports and, and infrastructure. But what will turn it around eventually? Yeah, well, as, as you can see now, uh, a lot of the shipping lines are investing in, in uh, new builds and, and empty boxes. But these are all longer term initiatives i mean it will take a lot of time before they enter the market and, and put any uh, relief to this industry so the problem here is really that it's the shipping lines who struggle financially and are heavily in debt they are now making a fortune right so you can see that on their earnings it's it's through the roof and they are the one that needs to fix the situation but if you think about these decades of, of, of that i said was has been troubling what is really their incentive to move fast on this when they are making such a good money, right? And this is partially the, the conundrum here that, that the cargo owners, the ones paying the shipping lines, the, the big companies we work with, whether it's you know General Mills, John Deere, Nestle, Electrolux, Unilever, all of these have enjoyed beneficial ocean freight rates for decades, whereas the supplier side has been trimmed down to a handful of companies that are now finally making a fortune out of these market conditions. And now we're hoping that they will, you know, fix it. But really, what is their incentive to do that in, in at least the short run? 
Yeah, and I hear you on that, and yet that's going to add to cost structure. If we talk about what some companies have been doing, they have been going to extraordinary lengths. What have you seen, given everything that you guys track in terms of timing and pricing, what are, what are some of the companies doing just to try and get around some of this, get the goods where they want them to be? Yeah, I mean, we've seen anything from train uh, operating from Far East to Europe, as an example, which is, you know, less utilized before. But on the extreme side, you can find a uh, situation like trucking from China to Europe, which is absolutely bizarre, from even China from an environmentally. Oh yeah, God. even from an environmentally perspective. perspective. And then, then you can see Home Depot coming out with, you know, their own chartered vessel that will move on the Trans-Pacific just to feed, make sure that they get their goods uh, into the shelves, right? So this is all sort of signs of a very broken market. And before I let you go, I don't have a lot of time. Where does your company step in there in terms of how does Zeneda help? Yeah, well, we help. We we empower them with market intelligence. We help them understand the market and and what they need to pay in order to get ship and which budget adjustments is really required when the market moves with several several hundred percentage points, right? And what does competitive freight rate rates really look like? And and I also want to just mention that I'm really happy to announce that we raised the 28.5 million dollar Series C round from a hedge fund in the U.S. Uh, U.S. named Luxor Capital. That we will, you, you know, deploy the capital to provide even greater insights over the next few years to all companies navigating these rough waters. Sure thing. It will certainly help to make that uh, shipping market more incentive, uh, more efficient. Uh, I hear you though. Get those Christmas gifts early because this could really end up being a problem. Patrick Merlin, CEO of Zenea, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate it.